Science and Human Objection or, and Human Origins Objections Part Four. We've been going through the uh, book Science and Human Origins by Anne, and I now know how to pronounce her name because I met somebody at the conference who had been uh, who had uh, met her, and she pronounced it Gager. That's not German or French; it's English pronunciation. Douglas Axe and Casey Luskin. Um, the uh, particular chapter that we're looking at is chapter four, which is Francis Collins' Junk DNA and Chromosomal Fusion, and it's written by Casey Luskin. Um, the book can be found on the web for free. So uh, you can uh, take the address and type it in, and you'll, you can get a download of the PDF. The, uh, according to Rational Wiki, uh, the book has been debunked by uh, Paul McBride. Um, we'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, he has two uh, blogs uh, which he deals with uh, uh, chapter one, one of which is not directly l labeled that, but needs to be read in conjunction with uh, this other one. Um, he has uh, an objection to chapter two, to chapter three, to the one that we're interested in now. There are two, and you'll see in just a minute uh, what's going on. And finally, it's to chapter five. Um, and that's one that, uh, Lord willing, we will be looking at next week. Um, where did I get this critique? Well, uh, Jeff Sonnenhag uh, posted um, on uh, clubadventist.com. And uh, there's the web address. And has been putting all of these... Uh, 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 presentations up on that website, and somebody by the name of Igakse, and uh, again, I'm going to have to correct uh, my pronunciation of his name because that's the way he pronounces it. Um, made a comment. Uh, here, some actual evolutionary biologists also go through the book chapter by chapter, and with reference to. Uh, uh, the one comment that we have, and also to Afarensis, and I have not paid as much attention to his critique, um, because at least according to Rational Wiki, uh, apparently uh, 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 Paul McBride does a more remarkable to them job. Um, although we did look at uh, Afarensis uh, last week, and I think that uh, he did make a valid point. Um, uh, Igakse, <coughs> uh, you can ask, is this critique uh, cherry-picked? And uh, if it was, it was by Igakse. Um, there are comments in the book at Rational Wiki, and this is the full part of the reception of the book. It is an anti-science book. <coughs> and has received negative reviews from scientists for pushing a religious agenda. Excuse me. <coughs> Don't have a cough suppressor here. The uh, sole purpose of the book was an attempt to try and prove Adam and Eve existed, which is interesting commentary on how they view the book. Uh, the book has been debunked chapter by chapter in a lengthy on online interview review by Paul Auckland, University of Technology, PhD candidate. And... Um, You'll notice the candidate, I have commented on this before, and we're going to come back to that comment in just a bit. Because I think the uh, comment on that comment is quite revealing. Well, Igakse um, apparently continued to view um, the uh, postings. And one of the comments that uh, Jeff made was I sent those links to you above to Paul Geem, so maybe he will peruse them and make comments about their objection. 
alternative opinions during the next recording. Well, it wasn't the next recording. I don't think it was maybe the recording after, but yeah, we got there. Um, and uh, Igaxi says, tell me if he does. Um, and then later on, much later, Who is this person? Um, well, we're going to learn all we know about him in just a bit. Um, he's the person who made the comment about, you know, some real evolutionary biologist. Um, and he said, sorry I haven't much, had much free time lately. He starts out, meaning me, by noting that, I, I put Agaxi's comments in green, it, that just, I thought yellow would be possibly insulting, so it's probably better to make it green. Um, <coughs> He starts out by noting that scientists don't hold their own people to the same standard. The context being that we haven't called out our Miss, uh, Mr. McBride for only being a PhD candidate, while we do occasionally call out other people for talking outside of their area of expertise. And he got the criticism pretty damn pat. If Dr. Geem understands why we do that, he's misrepresenting the real reasons. So here are the real reasons. It's not simply that they don't have the appropriate credentials, it's that they are displaying a lack of familiarity with the field they're pontificating on, and their lack of education may possibly indicate a reason why. In other words, they don't know what they're talking about, not that they don't have the degree, which yeah, I think I could see that. Um, I'd quote the opinion of an investment banker on human evolution if I thought that her opinion was properly informed and nuanced. And I won't generally quote the opinions of people like Jonathan Wells on evolutionary biology because despite having an, quote, actual PhD, end quote, actually two PhDs, but whatever, uh, in biology, he regularly misrepresents evolutionary theory by creating and debunking versions of it that are made out of straw. So, what's really going on here is they got the wrong viewpoint. Um, or at least they're not meeting our complaints head on. Um, now he doesn't like the way they, they're meeting the complaints. Something of that order. Um, when I linked to Mr. McBride's blog, it wasn't simply because he was credentialed authority on human evolution. It was because I believe that what he's saying is largely correct. And when I criticize someone like Mr. Luskin for misrepresenting the literature on human evolution, it's not because he doesn't have the proper academic training. It's because I believe he, he's intentionally misrepresenting the literature on human evolution. If I happen to point out his lack of formal training, it is absolutely not because I believe people outside can have valid or correct opinions on topics outside of their area formal, areas of formal training. So the snark wasn't probably totally necessary, although maybe he thinks that it, the, the snark is appropriate because, uh, uh, because the lack of training shows or something like that. I even did something similar in my first post in this thread. That's the snark. Um, but I'm explicitly not saying that Dr. Geem or the authors of this book are wrong because of their lack of training in human evolution. How could I, when I myself have very little advanced formal training in the field? So he's not an authority in the field. He trusts the authorities that he sees, uh, perhaps finds their logic convincing. Uh, and my question after that would be, and I haven't posted that because I have not had that kind of time, um, is it possible to understand the theory of human evolution and not accept it? Eventually I'd like to be able to post that back or maybe if he listens to this he'll I'd respond to that question. Uh, but the question is very simple. Uh, are we automatically ruled out anybody, uh, do we automatically rule out anybody who uh, doesn't believe because the fact that they don't believe means that they don't understand. Or can one understand and disagree? And if not, what does one do with people like James Shapiro, 
who thinks that traditional Darwinism is pretty much dead. Anyway, uh, to get back to his comments, uh, sorry I haven't been able to get to any of the meat yet. Lots going on in my personal life, which uh, at this juncture I understand quite well. <coughs> uh, P.S. It's pronounced igaxe, and that's how I know how to pronounce it. The U is kind of silent. Um, I should have picked an easier name. So, obviously, Igaxe is not his given name, and so you don't go Googling Igaxe and expect to find a, 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 a PhD candidate in some uh, uh, non evolutionary field, perhaps geology or something, um, because you'll be looking for the wrong thing. Uh, and then he posted again, uh, right afterwards. And I do want to say that my first impression of Dr. Geem has been positive. He's clearly intelligent and capable of nuance, and I don't get the impression that he's doing any of this in bad faith. So it's nice to get a little bit of a pat on the back. So far, I don't find his rebuttals convincing. I'll get to the reasons why, as time allows to uh, me to do it properly. So we'll see what happens. But um, I definitely don't get the same impression from him that I've gotten from Casey Luskin. I really like that. For the most part, he's, he so far appears to be attempting to understand the criticisms of SAHO before replying to them. Science and Human Origins, I assume. Um, and I'm open to changing my mind on any topic. I've already done it on this one once. I don't know how many 90-minute videos I can reply to, but so far he seems like a person I'd enjoy a good discussion with. So we'll see what happens. Well, that wasn't the complete the end of it. Um, after he'd view, viewed another, I assume he'd viewed another uh, uh, presentation, he said, I may have to retract some of the statements from my previous post, or at least qualify them. I think Dr. Geem needs to be a little more careful in selecting information from McBride's blog because he's probably unintentionally taken some things out of context and neglected to take the time to understand several of his points. And um, my comment to that is I'd like to know what things I am, am taking out of context, which points I am apparently not understanding. If uh, I, I'd appreciate the, a little more detailed feedback, but uh, we'll see. Regarding the bit about falsifying phylogeny, it needs to be said that Luskin's examples are pretty well, uh, pretty cherry-picked. You can take virtually any protein coding gene at random and use BLAST to generate a phylogeny, and you'll get an extremely similar one regardless of what gene you pick. The argument that some line up and some don't doesn't hold a lot of water when you do the experiment rigorously blinded and using genes that we would expect to reflect phylogeny. Um, I don't know how you do it blinded if you use genes that we would expect to reflect phylogeny. It seems like that's unblinding to begin with. Uh, how do you know that they would be expected to, if they were picked without knowledge of their, uh, of whether they fit the usual pattern or not, uh, one could make a case that, uh, which preferably would be picking them before you actually got the data. Uh, but uh, uh, obviously, Igaxe hasn't done any of this work himself, so I'm not sure that he would know whether they were in fact uh, cherry-picked. But be that as it may, I, I think it's a useful exercise, and uh, sometime we should try to uh, make an exhaustive or semi-exhaustive uh, list of of uh, some of these phylogenies and see whether uh, they do in fact match up and in what ways. And he gives several references. These are all in the, uh, in the comment that he made. He says there are, is tons of discussion on phylogenetics and falsification in academic publications, much of which can be found for free on Google Scholar with a simple search using words like phylogeny and falsification. 
the trees we've come up with aren't cherry-picked by people desperately looking for any pattern we can find. Of course, they may be cherry-picked by people who want to see the standard pattern. So the only way to really do this right is to either do exhaustive or randomized search. And uh, anyway, so that's what uh, Igaxe has been commenting on, and I thought that you people would be interested in that. Uh, getting to the uh, comments by McBride, um, he has two posts on this, and I'm going to read the first one in total because it's really hard to compress, and uh, I, it's very short as well. Prelude, I am going to start with a prediction. I have, I am yet to read chapter four. I've just taken it straight off of the, the internet copy-paste. The obligatory junk DNA written by Casey Luskin. But I have tried to discuss this topic numerous times with intelligent design advocates as my earlier posts on the topic attest to. The responses are always the same. I'm aware Luskin is not a molecular biologist, so I'm expecting him to do similar if less thorough job. I'm assuming that's a similar if less thorough job of presenting the same claims against junk DNA that have been made by Jonathan Wells and other ID advocates. So he's put him into a pigeonhole. Therefore, I am predicting that this chapter will. We're going to have 10 things he's going to predict. Number one, conflate junk DNA and non-coding DNA. Strange. I thought what we did was distinguish between the two. But uh, identify functions of non-coding DNA Introns allowing alternative splicing, for example, is evidence that junk DNA does not exist. Present a qualitative argument that because new function is found from time to time, for example, microRNAs, the base of junk DNA is continually being continually whittled away. Ignore the quantitative argument that such new discoveries account for a negligible fraction of the human genome, still leaving 90% unexplained. Make the argument that because active copies of transposable elements can play genomic roles, we can't discount the importance of any copies of transposable elements. Ignore that only a handful of copies of transposable elements are actively active and that most are defunct. Play a pervasive transcription while ignoring ev evidence that spurious transcripts are expected to be produced by error. Ignore the population genetic arguments for the existence of junk DNA, for example, the effectiveness of selection in small populations and the mutational load in mammals. Ignore the onion test, that is, if the junk is truly functional, then why do some closely related and ecologically similar species have several times more junk than others? We'll get back to that. And broadly, ignore every serious argument that provides support for inference of junk DNA and still claim a resounding victory. But perhaps I will be surprised. I will find out tomorrow. So that's what he comes into the chapter with uh, those expectations. Um, so let's go to his... Let's, let's go through those real quickly and just make a few comments on them, and then we'll go to the, the, uh, uh, the actual review itself. Um, my comment on number one is uh, if there's anybody that uh, conflates junk DNA and non-coding DNA, it is at least some advocates of neo-Darwinism. I don't think all by any stretch. And, and uh, certainly by now it's a minority, and even back then I think there were sober evolutionists who said, uh, there's probably a lot more to junk DNA, or, or probably a, a lot more to non-coding DNA than just junk. Identify functions of non-coding DNA. Introns allow alternative splicing, for example, as evidence that junk DNA doesn't exist. Well, uh, that would be, in my opinion, an extreme position for, for Luskin to take. And I don't know of anybody that actually takes that position and says so out loud. Uh, well, this is to make it, uh, because there are some functions somewhere, then there cannot be any junk DNA. I, that's, that's kind of extreme. Well, if they have functions, it's not junk. 
Yeah. Um, well, that's true. In fact, uh, we're going to preserve this for posterity, so that you can make as many comments as you like. <coughs> Hopefully, we can turn up the volume on the previous ones. Um, <coughs> but um, I think the refusal to allow the identification of functions for non-coding DNA would unfairly protect the concept of junk DNA. If you um, if you say that um, uh, that you can't identify junk DNA, um, then of course you will never ident identify it, uh, any function for it. And once it becomes a function, it really doesn't qualify as junk DNA. And that's why I say we really do distinguish between junk DNA and non-coding DNA. We know. Um, well, the, given the relatively small number of uh, amount of DNA that we have as humans compared to other things, you have to come up with some way that the uh, variation e exists. So, so there could be you know, lots of three-dimensional components to this and, and controllers and why some is turned on and others and are not. You know, there, there's got to be some explanation for that. You can't, you can't come up with enough proteins or enough uh, <coughs> uh, genes to explain that difference. Well, in a, in a bit, we will see the rationale for their arguing that there really is lots and lots of truly junk DNA that has no function whatsoever. Um, present a qualitative argument, this is what he expects Luskin to do, that because new function is found from time to time, that is microRNAs, the base of junk is being continually whittled away. Well, of course, if that's true, it is being continually whittled away. And again, the, the real question is, is it whittled away, you know, to 10% uh, uh, or to 90% or is it whittled away to 10%? It makes a big difference. So, yeah, I, I don't think this is a probative argument that's being used. But if you don't allow the argument at all, you are, again, you're trying to protect the concept of junk DNA. Yes, it is being eaten away a little bit. And you know, this is the kind of argument that science uses against religion all the time. Uh, putting science in the atheistic, uh, the current scientific consensus rather than, rather than just the methodology. Uh, that, that, look, we've explained this, we've explained this, we've explained this. You give us more time and we'll explain all the rest of it too. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. It doesn't look like it to me, but that's okay. If you want to believe that it's going to happen, you can. But it's a, it's a, it's a faith-based decision, whichever way you go. Um, maybe with some evidence. Well, this is what we're saying is that there is some evidence that we're starting to whittle away on the concept of junk DNA. Will we get all the way up there? Maybe, maybe not. But, um, uh, but to say you shouldn't even argue that way <laughs> sounds a little strange to me. Ignore the quali uh, quantitative argument that such new discoveries account for a negligible fraction of the human genome, still leaving 90% unexplained. Now, this is where we have trouble with different facts. Uh, different opinions is something we can deal with. Different facts, we need to review, I think, something. This statement ignores the ENCODE study. Now, you can say the ENCODE study is no good, and we'll seize people to do that. Uh, but you can't just dismiss it with a wave of the hand and then say, well, the, you know, the ENCODE says 80% of the DNA is functional and says that it may go higher than that. And they're making specific functional claims for this part, this part, this part. Um, you can't just say, well, I don't believe that without giving some kind of reason for your disbelief. So that's why we need to go and somebody needs to take the ENCODE study and go through it and uh, go through it with regard to um, the people who are opposed to it as well, so that we can get a good picture of whether ENCODE is really solid, is hinting at it but not probative, or is uh, not worth very much at all. 
uh, I think that it's fair to say that if one is inclined to accept it, one can say, well, you know, there's a study that suggests that junk DNA is shrunk down to some 20% of the human genome. Five, make the argument that because active copies of transposable elements can play genomic roles, we can't discount the importance of any copies of transposable elements. Well, I think that's a rational argument. Um, given ENCODE, I think we might be able to find some transposable elements that are not useful. Uh, I think you can even make the case that uh, some transposable elements are actually malevolent. Intelligently designed, but malevolent. But I think that the burden of proof right now is on those who would label them total junk. Six, ignore that only a handful of copies of transposable elements are actually active and that most are defunct. Um, again, he wants to call those junk DNA in the worst way, and uh, uh, I think that's stated like a proposition that is already proved, whereas uh, I think that's something that uh, we need to go over with uh, more thorough research. And until then, I think that we have to leave people with their own opinions on what's most likely true. Uh, play up pervasive transcription while ignoring evidence that spurious transcripts are expected to be produced by error. Um, my response to that is that he hasn't read ENCODE or maybe he hasn't comprehended it or maybe he simply disagrees with it. But somewhere in there, uh, I think that I think that it's fair to say, ENCODE's in the peer-reviewed literature, it's perfectly acceptable to say, well, I think that might, they might even have a point. Um, and uh, I think that that's where we need to have a conversation. Uh, ignore the population genetic arguments for the existence of junk DNA, that is, the effectiveness of selection of small populations and the mutational load in mammals. And uh, if we have time, we're going to go through some of those. And, uh, you know, my response to that is, uh, why not ignore theoretical arguments if they argue against the evidence? I, my way of looking at uh, um, science is that the evidence is king. That's what separates it from, um, uh, from the sciences practiced in the Middle Ages. Nine, ignore the onion test. That is, if the junk is truly functional, why do some closely related and ecologically similar species have several times more junk than others? And uh, I think that's a rational argument. Uh, it is one that's rooted in our, our, our ignorance. We have no clue as to why some species of onions have 4.5 times the uh, DNA content of others. Um, uh, does it help? Does it change what the onion is like? Um, is, does it function in any way? And if it doesn't function in any way, um, what might be the explanation for that? What he's trying to do, I think, is defend the concept of junk DNA, and not just any junk DNA, because creationists accept that we live in a fallen world. There should be some enzymes that are defunct. At least you kind of expect that. Uh, there should be some areas of the genome that are perverted. Um, but how much of that would we expect? Is it going to be 90% of the genome? Uh, is it going to be more like 50%? Is it going to be more like 10%, 5%, 1%? And the answer is any argument that I make will also be rooted in ignorance. We don't really know. Broadly, ignore every serious argument that provides support for the inference of junk DNA and still claim a resounding victory. Now, notice that McBride thinks that the whole struggle is over junk DNA and not over human ancestry. Or maybe he figures that if you can win on junk DNA, then human ancestry comes along for the ride free that uh, the connection between junk DNA and human ancestry is not really well explicated. 
But at any rate, his major attack in the whole thing is on junk DNA has little to do with the uh, chromosomal fusion, which we will deal with very, very shortly, therefore. Um, now, moving on to what he had to say uh, in the, after he'd actually read the chapter. Yesterday, I changed the format of my review a little. I predicted a few things about what I was expecting from Casey Luskin's effort to dismantle the argument for junk DNA, chapter four, before I had the chance to read it. Let's see how I did. Yeah, some he hit, some he didn't. Um, I'll also mention now that this chapter review is going to get technical at times, so we're going to be kind of stuck there with that kind of thing. Uh, Luskin's chapter is entitled Francis Collins' Junk DNA and Chromosomal Fusion. Apart from trying to make the case against the existence of junk DNA, Luskin wants to make it clear that he's very disappointed in Collins, who he chooses to frame as an evangelical Christian who embraces both Darwinian evolution and embryonic stem cell research. I can only imagine that the reader is expected to disapprove of the last point and therefore, of course, uh, downgrade uh, Collins' status. And he may be right on that. Uh, this is the Reader's Digest version. Uh, I don't have time to read the whole thing. I really don't have time to read what I have, but that's a different issue. Um, Luskin also notes that Collins and, quote, atheist Darwinist Richard Dawkins say very similar things when they speak about evolution. I think the implication there is pretty clear. Mm, he may be right about that. Um, when I was thinking about what to expect from this chapter, I predicted that Luskin would conflate non-coding DNA and junk DNA, and that Luskin would exploit this erroneous conflation by pointing to known functions of non-coding DNA as evidence against junk DNA. Um, here, Luskin wastes hardly a word. Luskin points out that studies have found excessive, extensive evidence of function for non-coding DNA showing that it is not genetic junk after all. He then starts a section called non-coding DNA, not really junk after all. In here, he cautions the reader that, quote, even a cursory review of the scientific literature shows that it is wildly inappropriate to simply assume that repetitive DNA or most other types of non-coding DNA are useless genetic junk. And then he uses an expletive. <coughs> and at this point I'm thinking, okay, so he disagrees with that last comment, right? Uh, that it's n not wildly inappropriate to simply assume that repetitive DNA or most of the types of non-coding DNA are useless genetic chunk. You might think that there should be some uh, features of that. And uh, I'd like to just see once all those references where all these researchers are saying that if DNA does not code for a protein, then it is junk. He agrees with Luskin. That just because something is non-coding doesn't mean it's junk. Maybe it's functioning as a centromere, maybe it's functioning as some kind of winding stuff. Who knows? Um, the whole issue leads me to wonder how much of the relevant literature Luskin has actually read. Well, but he's got it straight. You can't just assume. They're agreed on that point. In any serious introductory discussion of junk DNA, I'd expect to see Ono's 1972 paper, boy, Introducing the concept of junk DNA referenced and Ono's argument discussed. Well, what he wants to do is he wants to fatten the book up. Luskin does no such thing. He simply wants us to believe that Darwinists everywhere irrationally assert that all non-coding DNA is junk DNA. Well, I don't know if he said all. Well, the only assertions are his, and the dozen creationists before him that have done the same. None of the quotes Luskin provides from Francis Collins come close to saying any such thing. Wait a minute. Let's see if I got this straight. 
When Dawkins says in The Greatest Show on Earth, page 333, leaving pseudogenes aside, it is a remarkable fact that the greater part, 95% in the case of humans, of the genome might as well not be there for all the difference it makes. That sounds like junk DNA to me, doesn't it? I guess he's not representative of any kind of evolutionary thought. When New Scientist says, once the vast majority of our DNA was dismissed as junk, but now we know it is important, or so you might have read recently, referring, of, I'm assuming, to the ENCODE study. In fact, it still appears li likely that 85 to 95 percent of our DNA is indeed useless. While many bits of DNA that do not code for proteins are turning out to have some function or other, this was predicted by some all along, and the overall proportion of our DNA with a proven function it remains tiny. I guess they're not representative of evolutionary thought either. How long ago was that stated? Um, well, it's after the ENCODE study, so in the last year or so. Oh, really? So they're disagreeing with the ENCODE? Yeah, ideas. they're disagreeing with the ENCODE stuff. In fact, later in the blog, McBride himself is not representative of evolutionary thought when he quotes, apparently provingly, in yeast, Struhl argues that 90% of transcripts are spurious. They didn't need to be there. That's McBride. There's lots of junk DNA. Okay, we all recognize that some non-coding DNA is not junk DNA. On both sides. The real question is over the percentage. Is it more like 90% that's junk, or is it more like 20% and shrinking. I suspect that what's really happening is that McBride thinks we have misunderstood his position to be that only coding DNA accounts for function and that his position is therefore very fragile, easily disproven, whereas he allows for lots of other functions, but that those other functions still compose some 7%, 3% uh, for coding and 7% for the other, more or less, of the genome and that most of it is still junk. He is still arguing that the vast majority of DNA is non-functional. And that's where the real dispute is. If it helps any, some of us do understand that McBride and company's position is not so simplistic. Nor is that of the more thoughtful on our side. We don't think that intelligent design implies 100% function. For those of us who are Christian, this world is in a state of decay and it would be a surprise if DNA coding did not participate in that decay. That is, of course, my comment, not his. To get back to his comments, um, transposable elements are highly repetitive sequences that collectively make up close to half of our genome, and so are at the heart of any discussion about junk DNA. Luskin lists more than an entire page of bullet point func pointed functions. Surely transposable elements are functional, right? To answer that, we need to consider what transposable elements are, something Luskin clumsily I think that was uh, not an appropriate, but whatever. Um, omits from his chapter. Transposable elements get their name from their unusual property. They jump around in the genome. Certain classes of them also make copies of themselves that reinsert at random in the genome. Wh whether either of these things happen, some functions might change, or they might happen to land somewhere non-functional and cause no harm. But Variations in these transposable elements between different people are often linked to disease. Sometimes they move into the wrong place. We get a pretty clear picture of how good they, transposable elements, are at self-replication in our genome. And so we also get a pretty clear picture that they've all come from this activity. The most prolific transposable element has more than a million copies in your genome. Even though sometimes a new copy might land somewhere and shift the function of a gene, or later mutate and become part of a new gene, and there are certainly recorded cases of this, the majority of these duplications have no effect. Mostly, they land between genes or inside introns where they change nothing of importance. So, 
Uh, and I don't have any particular reason to dispute uh, the previous comments. They also mutate freely and quickly. The typical transposon accumulates random mutations to the point where it is no longer able to self-replicate. Of, of the about 45% of your genome made up of these repeated copies of transposable elements, less than 0.1% are functional retrotransposons. So you've got a lot of transposons sitting there, mostly, according to him, doing nothing. And uh, he may even be right about that. Luskin continues with an attempt to provide such evidence. Now is a good point to recall one of the other predictions I made, that Luskin would provide qualitative evidence of function in intergenic and other non-coding DNA, but will fail to provide a quantitative assessment for how this impacts our view of the genome. That is to say, he'd point to newly discovered function where none was known before and claim victory, yet fail to inform his readers that these intersect, interesting discoveries actually count for only tiny fractions of the genome. He does not tell his readers that because of the fractions of explained DNA are so small, the proportion of purported junk DNA in mammalian genomes has not shifted since the very first assessment by Ono, now 40 years ago. I think one of the things that's emboldened uh, people in the intelligent design uh, movement to, to work on this kind of thing is that, in fact, ENCO did suggest that there was 80% function. And so why should Luskin tell them that when the literature um, seems to be on his side? That's why the ENCODE is so important and why a review of it uh, is going to be necessary sooner or later. An area that Luskin highlights is that of pervasive, pervasive transcription. When a gene is used, it is transcribed into RNA. Those RNA transcripts might then be translated into protein. This is what happens for coding sequences. Or else they might be directly functional. For example, regulating genes, forming ribosomes, and so forth. Uh, Luskin is right to emphasize, oh good, we actually have a compliment here. Luskin is right to emphasize the diversity of roles played by RNA as they have been somewhat underappreciated in the past. Now, I'm just going to pull something out of Wikipedia, notorious creationist source you probably know. Uh, the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements, or ENCODE project, suggested in September 2012 that over 80% of DNA in the human genome quote, serve some purpose biochemically speaking. Now note that it doesn't say is transcribed, it says serve some purpose. This conclusion, however, is strongly criticized by other scientists. Uh, and I gather that McBride must be in the camp of the other scientists. Transcription is the first step when a stretch of DNA performs a, a cellular function. Back to McBride. What Luskin las latches onto is that several studies have su suggested much of our genome gets transcribed into RNA, pointing to the possibility that a far greater proportion of the genome is functional than had been previously considered. Luskin highlights a number of commentaries, although virtually no primary research literature, he did you know, highlight the ENCODE, but on this side of the argument, doing his readers a serious dis disservice. Um, well, in that case, um, I'd have to say McBride has done readers a serious misservice because uh, it would be nice if he cited a whole bunch of stuff. Um, he does cite one or two, so uh, there, is, uh, there is something to it. But uh, I'd like to see something a little more detailed. Anyway, uh, this is, in fact, a highly contentious area, and there are very good reasons to temper our excitement over pervasive transcription. The ENCODE study may not be, turn out to be completely correct. So uh, I think that a caution is advisable, um, but I certainly wouldn't go around saying that somebody's a total idiot for uh, taking the literature at face value. I'm going to skip a paragraph which doesn't add much, I don't think. But well, it's true that not all the, everything is transcribed is used. Um, how much misuse is there? Well, that's a quantitative argument, and that's why you have to delve into the literature. By the way, the person who does this is going to have at least 32 articles to read, and then plus whatever reactions to those articles there are. So that's why 
I say it's not going to be an easy job. Uh, Luskin bothers with none of this massive gray area, none of the controversy. He instead moves on to pseudogenes. Pseudogenes are genes that no longer function in their former capacity because they've been degraded by a mutation. Luskin highlights one example from humans used by Francis Collins as evidence of common descent, which Luskin simply calls a vitamin C pseudogene and describes as being supposedly functionless. Okay, is Luskin about to prove that this gene, uh, G-U-L-O-P, uh, G-U-L-O is uh, uh, the gene itself and P is a pseudogene, is not actually functionless? No, he moves on to a general discussion about other pseudogenes instead. A pity. I, I might say at this point that it sounds like he's conceding that Luskin does a pretty good job with the other pseudogenes. Otherwise, I think he'd attack him on those uh, pseudogenes as well. Uh, Gulop is fairly compelling evidence of our common descent among the primates, as Collins has previously said. The haplorine primates, meaning that means us and our closer relatives, differ from the other primates in that at one point mutations fixed in Gulo, the last component in the vitamin C synthesis pathway. At one point, mutations fixed, that's a verb, uh, uh, not a participle. Mutations fixed in GULO, the last component in the vitamin C synthesis pathway. Most likely this is because the fruit-based diet of the common ancestor of the haplorine primates was enriched with vitamin C such that the loss of the pathway was not detrimental. The same thing has happened in some fruit-eating bats, uh, fruit-eating birds, excuse me. We retain the legacy of this pathway in our genome, but none of its function. This non-functioning legacy is shared by the other closely related primates. The single mechanism that plausibly explains the sharing of a once functioning but identically broken gene is that we are related by descent. And that's the c core of that argument. The only alternative is to insinuate that it is only supposedly functionless without a single bit of evidence, which is Luskin's approach. I, I will point out that there is one other way of approaching it, and that is that you're dealing with a mutational hotspot, and if we have time, we may talk about that. Pseudogenes. Again, this is a number g numbers game. The majority are non-functional and contribute to our total junk, although they total only about 1% of our genome. I predicted that Luskin would talk about uh, introns and alternative splicing. Introns break up our genes with non-coding sequences, all of our protein coding sequences make up less than 2% of our genome. Um, I'd heard it was three, but uh, uh, whatever. That's close enough for me. But the introns that break them up make up about a third of our genome. So if introns have a function, suddenly functional DNA goes up to close to 40%. However, introns are not discussed at all by Luskin. This is a major omission. Oh, it would have been nice to have had that uh, little tidbit in Luskin. Um, I don't know whether he didn't know it or felt it wasn't uh, worth mentioning. But he wasn't really concerned about junk DNA so much as he was concerned about the arguments that junk DNA that was shared between humans and primates, uh, other primates, uh, meant, a, uh, meant a shared ancestry. I think that's the major reason he was commenting, and I think that uh, McBride missed that. Um, the rest of the chapter is spent discussing the fusion of two ancestral chromosomes to form human chromosome 2. Luskin argues that this is not proof of common descent and that there m may not have even been a fusion event. He argues that the telomeric DNA in human chromosome 2 is shorter than the telomeres found at the end of typical chromosomes. So far, he's doing a pretty good job of summarizing Luskin. Again, this is designed to cast a, stat, a small shadow of doubt on our common descent with other primates. Yes, that's true. No positive uh, argument is offered for an alternative model. Um, at this point, I'm going to skip down to the very last comment on his blog, which is done by somebody called Anonymous, which is very interesting and may have some pertinence here. Coming late to the party, creationists say that canines, canids are of one kind, are one kind. Um, I'm not sure intelligent design people necessarily say that. Uh, they may. Uh, but, but 
having answers in Genesis speak for the intelligent design community is probably not a appropriate. But anyway, baromenologists, creation scientists who work uh, to identify created kinds, have d determined that many animals represented by a single breeding pair in the ark have diversified so that today they are typically represented by a whole family. For example, the family Canidae is believed to be made of, up of animals from one baromen, a single created kind. This family includes dogs, wolves, coyotes, foxes, and jackals. According to Wikipedia, probably authoritative in this, in this field, it would be interesting to go back to the original literature, but I, I think it probably Wikipedia reflects that. Um, these vary in chromosome count between 78 in coyotes, wolves, and dogs, 66 in gray fox, 64 in the fennec fox, and 34 in the red fox. And it would be very interesting to know whether those can uh, mate with each other and produce uh, viable offspring. If they can, it suggests that uh, they probably were all of one created kind. And my understanding is that you can get crosses. <coughs> uh, so Luskin should go uh, to explain to the creationists how unlikely it is to have happened in the last few thousand years since the flood and get back to us. And of course, that's you know, nice little kick. Uh, first of all, Luskin <laughs> believes in a lot more time than four thousand years, or maybe he doesn't, but doesn't say it. But uh, certainly, I haven't seen anything from him that disputes the time frame at all. The, the, so, he's to tar him with the creation's brush is really not fair. But I want to go back. Let's supposing that wolves, coyotes, foxes, and dogs are all the same created kind. What that tells you in that case is that chromosomal fusion happens, or splitting, one of the two, happens all the time. So the fact that humans had a, if they did have a fused chromosome, it wouldn't be a big deal. And in which case I think that the argument for humans have to be related to chimps because they have a fused chromosome, really kind of falls apart. What it is is uh, evolutionists made a, one prediction, it came true. I don't think that that confirms the theory, although it is mildly confirmatory evidence. This is, um, uh, this is what also struck me in Luskin's discussion of transposable elements. In a tra chapter of a book purportedly about intelligent design, I would ap have appreciated a model under which such selfish replicating elements of our genome could be understood as a rational component of design. Perhaps this would tell us something about the nature of the mysterious designer. For example, a designer who would use such elements would appear to be a hands-off designer because they would be willing to trade the suffering of dysfunction and disease caused by these elements with occasional adaptations over the long term. In other words, they, uh, in that case, God doesn't really care for his creation. An oddity about intelligent design is that its proponents dislike anyone trying to draw inferences about the designer, yet I have never heard of any complaints about archaeologists using the designed objects of ancient civilizations to do the same. And this is a valid criticism, but I think it backfires on it. Uh, intelligent design doesn't like to discuss the nature of the designer for two reasons. Number one, if you say that the designer had to be God, then you're introducing religion into class. Uh, you can call that hypocrisy if you want. Um, it, but uh, but that is very understandable given what the um, U.S. court system has been doing lately. Number two is that you can't really absolutely prove what kind of an intelligent designer that you can simply make the case for the, the best intelligent designer. So if you're looking at proof, uh, then it's probably appropriate not to talk about it. Uh, but I'm going to suggest there's a number three that's probably the most important part. Intelligent designers are pri trying to get somebody to accept that intelligent design is a reasonable possibility. 
Once you do that, it, in my opinion anyway, rapidly becomes the most reasonable possibility. But there are many people for whom God just simply can't exist, and they're dead set against any, any kind of supernatural. There's no way they're going to admit that. And so what, uh, if, if they have an argument that may eventually lead them to accept the possibility of there being an intelligent designer who is supernatural and uh, knows, if not everything, certainly way more than we do. Um, that they will reject the evidence because where it might lead in the conclusion. That is to say, what we have is kind of anti-religious discrimination. And uh, so it's not really an oddity about ID. You expect that. They can make a good argument, but if a person uh, is not going to the supernatural at all, under any circumstances, then the only thing that we can agree on is that it's a possibility that there's an intelligent designer. And um, even Richard Dawkins admitted that was a possibility. We have it on tape. Nobody would ever believe it if we didn't. But they go around acting like there can't possibly be an intelligent designer. Intelligent design is not part of science. Whereas, now you notice that he acknowledges that archaeology is reasonably part of science. So what we have here is um, somebody who's trying to and in fact, even here, what, he, what he's saying is, come out and tell me who your intelligent designer is, because what he's thinking is they're going to say God. And then he's going to get him. Well, your God just really doesn't care about disease. You know? Of course, my response is, maybe they're designed, maybe they're malevolent. Maybe there's more designers than God who... Uh, is able to do this kind of thing, and or was able, and what we see is the end results. To get back to him, um, I haven't given any of the population genetics arguments for why there must be the junk DNA, or at least DNA that can freely accumulate and cha uh, change. These are a compelling positive basis for, from which to understand junk DNA. The reason I haven't discussed them is because Luskin failed to address them, including the original one by the originator of the term junk DNA. I've explained elsewhere already there are four links there for those who'd like to know more than what Luskin is willing to tell them. And I went through those links. And uh, I'll give you my summary. And if you don't you know, like it, I guess go back and look at the links yourself. Um, one, evolution should have produced lots of junk DNA. Well, that's assuming evolution. And if you don't assume evolution as the answer for everything, uh, then maybe you don't expect quite as much junk DNA. Number two, less junk DNA and the genome would be deteriorating. That is to say, this is a defense against Sanford's thesis. Well, maybe Sanford is right and these people are wrong. In which case, that's a creationist argument, interestingly enough, short-age creationist. One closely related species may have 4.5 times as much DNA as another. Those are the two onion species. Is all of that entirely necessary? I don't know, unless you were to take and cut out all of that DNA and put it and see if you get the exact same onion species, and if so, um, maybe it isn't necessary. If not, maybe it is. Uh, there is little or no conservation of the sequence of some DNA. Uh, you can change people's skin a great deal and they're still people. Uh, I suspect that there are places in the DNA that don't make much difference. Uh, maybe some DNA is used as explicitly as a spacer. 
that you have to have so much DNA between, let's say, the promoter region and the gene itself. You need that space. In Huntington's chorea, there are five repeats in the average person of a particular sequence. If you have 12 repeats, you start getting some Huntingtonoid symptoms. If you have 127 repeats, you have the full-blown uh, thing. 35 seems to be where the, where the real problems start. But what that suggests is that there are areas. Now, I don't know. Maybe, maybe if you had zero of them, uh, you'd be even better. Or maybe if you had zero of them, you'd be dead. The fact of the matter is we just don't know that much. Introns are too big. That is to say, there's way too much. How, much, how big should an intron be? I don't think we know. Um, the fact that some animals have bigger introns and some animals have smaller introns, does that have more information? Is it totally irrelevant? Uh, it's hard to say. Uh, plant mitochondria have larger genomes than animal mitochondria. And all you really need, I guess, is the animal mitochondria. So all the stuff in the plant mitochondria is junk. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. And again, junk DNA doesn't ruin. What we're really looking at is, does junk DNA indicate that humans and chimpanzees have a common ancestor? And I think you missed that point. Luskin has continued in the tradition of the other chapters in this book by ignoring all of the best arguments that run contrary to his while making previously refuted arguments with biased evidence pretty much in line with what I predicted before reading the chapter. He presents no positive case for a pervasively functional genome. Jaw drop. ENCODE is not a positive case. I mean, it may be a flawed positive case. But to make the assertion that it's not a case whatsoever, that's crazy. And has only set out to cast doubt on the concept of junk DNA. No, he hasn't. He was talking about specifically about junk DNA and human origins. And I guess that point just went by McBride. Even in this, he's comprehensively failed. Uh, well, maybe. Uh, depending on ENCODE, maybe not. The book is called Science and Human Origins, but the science is threadbare and treated unevenly and unfairly. I guess readers will have to judge. I bolded that one comment. McBride's, uh, my take, McBride seems to argue that theoretical reasons for the existence of junk DNA are strong and that ENCODE was therefore, partly therefore, but also uh, just on its own flawed. Therefore, Luskin cannot be right in his arguments and should be discounted. Now, I think ENCODE deserves more respect than that. Um, we will see. McBride properly pointed out that Luskin had introduced Gulo without giving a good defense of shared mistakes without common ancestry, particularly in that case. Now, I think there's a better defense that can be found in the video f from this class. Um, back a, I have to look it up, and, but it, uh, vitamin C in evolution, if you go to this website and uh, search for vitamin C, you'll probably find it quite easily. Um, McBride seems fixated on the idea that creationists or ID advocates think that any function of formerly presumed junk DNA disproves Darwinian evolution. Uh, I don't know, maybe he's been arguing with the wrong ID advocates. I, I hope that he's not just setting up a straw man deliberately. The existence of and implications of hotspots in the genome, I think, deserve more attention. And finally, I think that McBride may be partly right out about the genome. There may be a significant amount of junk DNA, um, but uh, that may have been malevolently designed. Now, I think that's a huge discussion, and uh, we need to reserve that until someone who's researched it thoroughly can present it. And I do know somebody like that. Um, whether we'll be able to get him here or not, I don't know. Anyway, I have taken way too long, I think. But uh, looks like we have a good share of our people here. So comments, questions?
Well, uh, nobody has any questions. I guess we can see you next week. Uh, and uh, thanks for staying through what for some of you is probably a boring monologue. We'll, uh, we'll discuss chapter five next week.